Hello, everybody. All right. We are getting into studying Karl Marx, Uncle Karl. Now, I've talked to a lot of you who I have class with in person, but those of you online, um, probably in sociology, the most contro controversial figure. Uh, you really will only get marks in maybe some philosophy, critical theory, which encompasses a lot of different disciplines. Uh, a lot of it's just poo-pooing on Marx. And like it, he's in high school curriculums. They always like, <laughs> I completed all the, uh, I, I was considering being a high school history teacher. And it was mostly just communism doesn't work because people are lazy and it, there's no incentive to work. There's a lot of bad ideas. And this information we're learning about Marx is classical Marx. So some ideas are still relevant. Marxism is a whole spectrum of beliefs, right? It's like Christianity. Is everybody Catholic? Is everybody Mennonite or Quaker? No. This is classical, orthodox, old Marxism. People today who are Marxist only believe some ideas, maybe ideas about uh, alienation and estrangement, um, surplus value of labor. There are some ideas uh, that are pretty popular. So among Marxists still, uh, uh, even if they're varying kinds. So we're going to go into brief overview. Don't be scared. This is a college class. So we have to learn about things we might be afraid of. Okay. We're going to make it through this. He's a philosopher, socialist, revolutionary. Um, I'm going to read here. Main themes of his work. Like him or hate him. One of the most influential thinkers that shaped the modern world. So... A little pamphlet. First and foremost, you, most of you guys know I'm already, one of my majors is religious studies. I have a master's degree in that. Uh, and I would argue probably the most creative and destructive force in the world is religion. Creative and destructive. Um, probably the Communist Manifesto is a pamphlet caused, that pamphlet caused the most change in a short amount of time compared to any piece of literature in the world because you know the bible wasn't around till a certain time the gutenberg press um and you know the world was industrializing so information could spread faster and it's a pamphlet it's meant to be read by the common person but that pamphlet caused so much social change in the world so like it or hate it powerful force okay Marx and Engels, both German philosophers, social thinkers. Uh, they're influenced by European revolutions, right? And these ideas, you, you know, we're, we're only going to go into it a little bit, like historical materialism. Um, this was an attempt to come up with like a scientific social theory, right? Uh, I believe it was Marx, you know, who said this, uh, you know, sociology and social science is philosophy in action you're not just supposed to study philosophy you're supposed to change the world right so it's using these principles these ideas and doing something about it right not just sitting in a university classroom right so the german ideology um this is where we see historical materialism class formation now major thing sort of in common with a lot of our classic figures is meta history, right? History moves, uh, or meta theory, history moves in stages. Okay. Uh, this is very controversial with some people, right? It's like, Oh, how can you predict the future or classify these periods of time that have so many factors, right? But we're calling this historical materialism. So interpreting history in stages, right? According to how we use goods, 
how basically economics, right? This is very much in the writings of Marx and Engels will describe these stages we go into, um, the sort of hunter-gatherer stage, stage of feudalism, stage of, you know, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, merchants and wage earners. Okay, these are, you're just going to see the idea of things moving in stages. This is popular, like, in a lot of religions, um, you know, Buddhism and Christianity. Um, so this is nothing new. And even now, even though we criticize this, think about the term millennial or baby boomer or Gen X. This is just a massive overgeneralization of people born in certain time periods, stages of behavior, stages of personalities, right? Um, people people criticize ideas and then, you know, subconsciously use them in their own time. So, okay. Again, we see the specific view of history. This is a lot of like anti-Hegelian or like Hegelian philosophy, which is very complicated. I'm not a philosophy major. But we'll have these ideas that Hegel popularized and Marx and Engels just kind of flip it upside down. So in Hegel's view, humans are creative consciousness, are separated and find each other again. And there's this sort of like ending of finding God again. And this is the idea of religion. Uh, the idea of connecting with God is just not present in historical materialism. It's more like the worker gaining consciousness and workers coming together in solidarity um, to make the proletarian revolution, the workers revolution happen, you know, going through these stages of seizing control called the dictatorship of the proletariat then socialism, then communism. Um, so this is, you have Hegel sort of like human beings, History is moving towards a separation from God and back to God. And in Marxism, it's like the wage uh, earner, the, the worker being screwed over. <laughs> uh, there during like caveman times, like everybody was fishing and hunting, but then a split happens. We'll, we'll go over that. And then at the very end, you know, it, it, the workers become conscious and sort of take things over again. So... We have the dialectical process of ideas. We talked a lot about this in my class in person, but the stages, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, right? An idea, its opposite, and then sort of a fusion, like an understanding that you wouldn't come to unless you compare these opposites. It's a very old idea. This process of comparing opposites is sort of like a philosophical, a tool of philosophical inquiry, right? Um, it's, it's a tool that's useful for learning, to understand things. So if we want to understand basketball uh, compared to chess, so we need a court, like a game board for chess, uh, the chess board. We have a ball in basketball, and we don't in chess. We have little, uh, pieces that represent roles, but we do have roles in basketball. And the goal, basketball, is to continuously make baskets you can get points that way, three points, two points. You can get foul shots, um, penalty shots. And in chess, it's strategic maneuvers to checkmate the king, trap the king. Um, what are the things these have in common? They're both games. There's roles. Certain players should only be doing certain things. Um, points, um, an end goal to the game, two teams. Uh, in reality, after comparing those two unlike things, it kind of makes you think of how much base, uh, basketball is unlike chess, right? Or how much chess is unlike basketball. But then we can come to a new understanding and analyze certain positions, right? How is a, a forward or a point guard or a defensive person like a chess piece? Maybe, um, I don't know that much about basketball <laughs> or chess to compare, but... The roles are similar. There are roles. You, certain chess pieces can't do certain things. And so this kind of like philosophical inquiry, and then even to a more extreme example, how is chess like rock, paper, scissors? All these are games, right? We have some things. You use your hands to play all of them. Rock, paper, scissors, chess, and basketball. Your hand touches the ball. Um, so it just makes us think about 
questions and problems in new ways, like a way to probe and understand, further your understanding, uh, thinking of opposites. So um, let's see, keep going. Historical materialism, again, right? These history moves and stages, and it's really paying close attention to economics. So uh, four premises, according to Marx, we must produce our means of existence. Satisfaction of our needs will lead to new needs. We must reproduce. Um, this is just basically caveman life, right? We have to hunt, gather, kill woolly mammoths, fish. We have to make children uh, to carry on, what, to survive, you know, have more people in our tribe. Um, and as we do both, we have to engage in social relations, relationships with each other. We can't, you know, get mad and hit everybody over the head with our caveman club because there won't be anybody left, right? We need each other. So this is sort of like a convincing argument, right? And that's the beginning stages of sort of this hunter-gatherer stage. And now out of that, uh, the division of labor, you know, we're all in our sort of tribe, right, in ancient times. And we have to divide up the group. We have to divide up the tribe. So maybe um, there's uh, some female members that are good scouts, right? They can point out to where it'd be really quiet and sneak and point out to like, oh, there's a woolly mammoth over there. And then we have like the strongest spear throwers. So we get those people to do that. And then we have people that are skilled with our maybe like obsidian or, um, you know, napped bone or uh you know rock little nap knives and we you have to cut the meat from the bone really quick to load it on like a, a sled probably and we might have some dogs carrying the sled to make the meat go back to our camp easier but all these jobs right there this is we start to see the division of labor as we grew people do different jobs right but there's a very important interesting fact that at some point in time there's a uh, priesthood that starts right this is like shamanism this is like you know your uh spiritual priesthood that develops that probably doesn't hunt and probably doesn't gather they are doing rituals maybe marriages death ceremonies people go there for spiritual advice just think of the shaman or like early times uh a priest in early times as like the combined roles of like psychologist, therapist, healer, maybe they know some plants, um, uh, probably judge or lawyer, right? Spiritual law, going to someone for advice, um, doctor, right? We talked about healer, uh, scholar, right? They're uh, interpreting maybe divine signs or remembering prayers or special sacred songs. What's, what's the main difference between a hunter-gatherer and a priest is one is physical labor, one is mental labor. And it's at this stage that society starts becoming more and more complex and we start to see the birth of civilization. So think of early civilizations like Egypt or Sumeria. What distinguishes them is agriculture, civilization, which is religion, uh, written, an alphabet, recording of history, uh, you know, a calendar, all these things. Uh, this is when the intellectual side starts growing in a sedentary, you know, agrarian environment. And there are other ways to have a civilization, like more like a nomadic, uh, but even something like the Mongolian empire, like Genghis Khan collected priests from different cultures are still a religious in his court, in, still a religious element. Um, so that's just a part of the division of labor that happens that it's very interesting what Marx says about that. Okay, difference between Marx and Smith. So Smith is only concerned about the degree of specialization, less concerned about what's produced and Smith sees the division of labor as positive. Um, so what does Marx say? That this starts the creation of classes, right? And again, whether you like Marx or hate him, his criticism of capitalism is 
the most interesting thing about his ideas. Because once you start to read and see a lot of his ideas present and pointing out the flaws in capitalism, he's got something right. And we still haven't addressed a lot of those problems, which makes him so interesting to study. Okay. So again, remember we read Smith and we have, you know, universal opulence, right? Every, uh, everybody can afford cell phones and wool coats and computers, right? But Mark says, yes, you get these creature comforts, but there's something else that's going on. These classes develop. So we have from like a feudalism, right? We talked about like the cavemen, but going into feudalism, what was the way you had power? There's a king, queen, noble houses. You have hereditary power. And once somebody has hereditary power within generations, most of the time that wealth is going to be safeguarded, right? But in modern times, the bourgeoisie is the merchant class. There are these clever sort of like serfs and peasants that found their way to use buying and selling and trading to gain an advantage and create a whole new class. And we see the birth of democracy and power shift between hereditary power and people who have like wealth in their family. Um, more like royalty versus merchant class royalty, old money versus new money, right? And we see as the industrial, like as the industrial revolution happens, this like lowering of royal power, right? Uh, increase of uh, powers of government, parliament, um, less reliance on the, the power of divine right as the king having like ultimate power. So you see a tremendous shift and that has to do with economics. So classes, bourgeoisie is another, another word, middle-class owners of capital. Um, you know, there's like that word bougie from a lot of like popular songs. That's where it comes from, bourgeoisie. Um, it's like upper and middle-class. There's like bourgeoisie and petite bourgeoisie. So bourgeoisie would be like upper middle-class, even though it says middle-class here. Uh, classes, groups of individuals to share composition, forces of production. We don't need to know that. Proletariat, that's the worker, the wage worker. Okay. No matter how rich you are, the true difference in wealth is if you're an owner versus a wage worker. So I asked this question in class, what kind of job do you want? What kind of job makes the most money? People say, oh, a medical doctor or an engineer or uh, a lawyer. You aren't, to make the most money, you're gonna own a hospital that employs doctors. To make the most money, you're gonna own your own law firm where, you're ha where you own a more majority share compared to a partner or an associate at a law firm. And you're gonna make more money running an engineering company, hiring engineers. This is all like the bourgeoisie class, right? Wage workers make significantly less. Even you might think like, a, you know, football players, basketball players, they make millions. Who makes more? The owners of those teams, right? So again, the stages of historical development, tribal, uh, ancient, communal, feudal, industrial. Just one, you guys have a main idea. This, this isn't gonna be a test question. This is going to be this concept on alienation. So alienation has become a general term that attempts to describe the feelings of psychological angst, isolation from the social world and the breakdown of cultural pattern. So alienation, a general idea is the feeling you get when you're doing a job you do not like, especially over a period of time. Think about this. All of you think about the words you hear your parents say when you're little, when, they do, when they're when they doing a job you don't like, the, fr the, the words of your friends um, coming home from a job they don't like, uh, the behavior of people. Weekend is like, why is the weekend so special? Why do, you know, everybody's working for the weekend. Why is that such a special concept? Because it's non-work time, right? Your whole life is just waiting for the pauses in work. 
or maybe you're even uh, unlucky and you're so stressed you're thinking about work on the weekend or in your dreams this is you're not getting paid for that alienation happens in four stages we're going to go through these so uh the judeo-christian ap approach this is more like hegelian philosophy alienate alienation from god but that's not marx but marx is influenced by Hegel. okay this text, which was translated later, economic and philosophic manuscript, my, manuscripts. Um, keep going. This is the first, okay, this is about alienation in general. We have another concept, species being. This is to understand alienation. So Marx's idea of humanity, it's kind of difficult to understand because this word species being is very vague, but it's sort of like the creative potential inherent in all people. So think about how no other animal on earth is like a human being, right? You see us, you know, we, we can change our environment, think like logically and reason, uh, using reason, be creative. No other animal on earth is like us. So this is sort of the amazing creative potential of a human. I think, think of what happens when you're forced to do something you don't like what happens to your creative spirit, right? Even if you don't agree with Marxism, have you guys seen the uh, triangle of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? The very top, this is what all the things you need to be, to be happy, right? The bottom, sh food, shelter, or food, water, air, shelter, a job, friends, social network, maybe relationship, like significant other. And then at the top, once you have all that, creative self-actualization having enough money and having the job you like to do things that are creative this is kind of what marx is saying you can't be creative unless you have all more than the basics food shelter water and some like dis like extra resources to get things or else you're always going to be stressed or worried about you know work uh okay Here's where we get to start understanding what it is. This is Marx describing what happens to the worker. His labor becomes an object external to him, an external existence, but that it exists outside him, independently of him and alien to him and begins to confront him is an autonomous power that the life which he bestowed on the object confronts him as hostile and alien. The product is seen as having a life of its own which works against the worker. So this starts to happen and your work self starts to become different than your home self. There's an amazing move, uh, show called Severance on Apple TV. This is basically Marxism. And this show, the workers willingly undergo a procedure called severance. They have part of their skull like drilled open like metal rod is put in between like the two halves of their brain and a little like metal kind of like tiny little machine splits their consciousness. So there's a separate work self and a separate home self. The self at home, you know, you get to have a beer on your day off, do all the chores you would at home. You come back to work. And as soon as you go back to work, the home self ceases to exist. And then, you are your work self. So the work self never goes home. It goes in the show. You're working at the office. You go to the elevator to go home. And then you wake right up again, coming down the elevator and you're back at work. There's no perception of that lapse of time because there's the severance. There's the split. It's a very, very interesting satire. And that is, you guys should watch that. It's the perfect, perfect, perfect representation of alienation. So Four main characteristics. This is a test question, but let's focus on the first, not the three aspects, but nature, himself, species, being, and fellow man. Those four will be test question. Man becomes alienated from nature. So when you're an office worker or a factory worker, you uh, are separated from nature because we used to be what? Cavemen, right? You can hunt, you can fish, you can dress an animal. You can make a TP. Can we do all those things now? The modern person? No. That 
is so foreign to us. So if the power goes out, our civilization collapses, a lot of people will just die because they don't know what to do. And all the things that we make are just transformed pieces of nature. Your car, your computer, those are all from natural objects, just transformed many and many times. Isolated from nature to where they seem totally separate, but they're not. So when we work, we're separated from nature, the natural world. We're separated from ourselves, right? This is the work self, you know, home self separation from that show. You're 40 hours, you're nine to five. It's not you. You have to behave a different way. You have to be stressed, enter another type of hierarchy, have a boss. And if you do a job you don't like, over time, it just becomes this separate self, right? A lot of people do a job they don't like so they can retire and then do the things they don't, they finally can like, and they'll like die of depression or they won't even make it into retirement or they do, they retire and you spend your whole life working in a job. You're a different person. You're a worker. You probably feel more comfortable working. You can't enjoy yourself. The third that kind of goes into species being. We are alienated, alienated from our creative self to where we become something else. The creativity starts to be lost. We start to be more like machine than human. And for uh, our fellow men, so humans, when we're in a corporate environment, have you guys ever gone to a job interview and you see the other people there? Are you thinking, oh, that's, uh, that's my brother or sister. I love them. I hope they get the job. No, they're your competition. You're entering the rat race. You hope they don't get the job. That's why you're there to get the job for yourself, right? Okay, positive note. <laughs> In your current situation, what kind of things can you do to minimize, uh, minimize the alienation you feel? So you guys are taking this class. Remember, you're already doing something positive to change your situation to maybe find a job that's more of your calling, um, to gain skills, to get a you know transfer, get a certificate. You're already doing something to change your situation. So, you know, pat yourself on the back for that. You don't have to be taking this class. And, but you are. And that's a positive direction, going in a positive direction to kind of change your situation for the, for the better. Other things you can do to not feel alienated, more self-care, right? When you get off work, like, I don't know, say maybe like positive affirmations, prayers, take a bath relax, separate work. Uh, even though the alienation is occurring, you don't have to bring it home with you. Don't take your work home with you, right? That's something you can do. And then you're taking a college class to get another job that hopefully if it's your calling, it won't feel like a job. This job, I don't get paid much, but uh, I am in law school, so I'm going to get a job that does pay me, but I'm going to do a type of law that I like because I like to research. I like to argue. It's part of my personality. So, uh, and I like to teach, right? Right. Like right now, I love reading about Marx and I'm doing something that makes me happy. You know, I'm recording this right now. It's about 9 PM. I, uh, studying all day at the library at school, law school, but this job makes me happy. You know, I'm, I get to have this conversation with you, uh, my students, and we're kind of like taking a big picture of you of our whole life and our situation and thinking critically, looking at a type of thinking Marxism that's so different from the mainstream. So the more you do things that are creative, the more you do things that are what you like, um, you slowly like connect back to your, what Marx would say, species being. So, you know, Pick up a guitar that you haven't, you know, touched in a long time or do something creative. You know, I've done like open mics, karaoke, things like that can like reconnect you to your creative self. So, okay. I think, let's see. Let's read this quote. The result of this alienation was to turn man into an animal for he felt at ease when performing the animal functions of eating, drinking, and procreating. 
the more powerful the outer alien world, the more an inner man's world becomes weaker and not his own. So we're going a little bit deeper into Marx. I don't think we need to, this is more like fetish, uh, fetishism and commodities, sort of his view of um, the capitalist system, how we view money, right? So this slide, uh, the God of the capitalist world is money. All human values are warped and eventually expressed in monetary terms. Mankind is turned into a commodity taught to worship money. What is a commodity? A commodity in a capitalist system is a good or service uh, turned into an individual unit that can be more easily bought and sold. And so, you know, you, you're, you will hear people saying, you know, you'll, you'll hear a kid sing on YouTube. Or no, just sing in front of their family. Oh, you have such a good voice. You should do something with it. Maybe they want to make a YouTube video. Maybe they want to take singing lessons, right? But let's say, let's take the dark side example. The family goes nuts. Like, oh, Junior, I don't want you to give up on your dream. You like to sing. Let's make a YouTube video every week. And we have to, you know, take lessons and go to singing competitions. And pretty soon the kid's like, I don't want to do this. I just like to sing sometimes it's turned into like a monetized version of something that was like innocent and creative, right? This is uh, just the way capitalism work. You have to have items that can be reproducible to sell easily, to be traded more easily. So for Marx, if the aim is to create the best conditions for the development of the human personality and happiness, if economic alienation poses as the chief obstacle to the realization of this goal, the battle must be waged against the principle of private property. This is because economic alienation naturally institutionalizes itself in the form of private ownership of the means of production. The entire capitalist system, one foundation is private property. And our laws about private property were in, you see in different historical epochs like noble houses and royalty, right? Your, your, your land, your family land is important. And in a modern industrial sort of capitalist system with merchants, that would be like the land of like factories, uh, real estate, like private ownership of capitalists, right? This is very, very important to how this system works because this is so much law and enforcement of law is based on protecting personal property, ideas of private property. Um, this is just a part of the capitalist system. On the one hand, you know, we see like Native American cultures having like uh, more, no some of them having more like nomadic lifestyles, right? They're setting up teepees or for Mongolians, you know, yurts. These are more nomadic, right? In ag uh, agrarian culture, there's, you know, civilizations sitting still and in ancient times, it would be almost probably impossible for a common person to have property. It can be used as a weapon, right? Look at uh, inflation now, right? It's very hard to find a job where people can buy property. And in fact, there are there's like a concentrated effort of a lot of different businesses to purchase, drive the value up so that people can be, you can make more money if people rent things, right? Um Similarly, you can kind of advance up in the capitalist system by owning and selling property, right? That can really affect your generational wealth, uh, home ownership and having land. So it's an important part of that system. But according to Marx, it's a huge obstacle, right? It's the devil's bargain, right? This is a picture of a iPhone factory in China. Those nets are installed so that people who are working there, Chinese people, cannot commit suicide. So this is not just Apple. You know, I have an Android. Clothes and objects. Another part of Adam Smith's sort of division of labor that's not talked about is the exploitation of the third world. It goes hand in hand with capitalism. It has to have new markets over and over raw materials, cheap labor, 
and exist in environments where there's less pollution, I mean, less regulation. So pollution can occur, Le uh, easier restrictions to pay workers less, right? Look at this net. These people want to commit suicide. We have suicide as a problem in our own country. But this is a perfect example. It's a little disturbing of alienation, right? These are child workers in the Industrial Revolution. Before Freud discovered that you can have irreparable damage from a child, uh, they might be psychologically damaged and the state might have to take care of them. So children should go to school. Also like the massive amounts of injuries. <clears throat> okay. So sorry to leave you with those disturbing images, but capitalism gone too far. This is what happens, right? And we have, you know, whether you like Marx or not, and we're not even going into his ideas, uh, of like communism and socialism barely, right? But just think a society ruled by workers, it's more like democracy in the workplace, like a co-op. Like if you've been to Winco or other uh, companies where the workers own more part of the company, that's pretty much what communism is. It's worker owned, worker owned property, worker owned businesses, right? Like kind of how unions are. Do you wanna have healthcare and make more money? then you'll probably want to join a union. Are unions bad? Maybe if you're a private business owner and it's affecting your business, but if you have a big enough company to where you have your workers unionized, I bet you, you have some generational wealth in your family. So you can probably afford to open up another business. Uh, anyway, just some basic ideas for the test. I want you to know alienation. I want you to know, uh, historical materialism, how history moves in stages, and uh, bourgeoisie versus proletariat. That's just, you know, 1% versus the 99%. 99 um, a dialectic, we talked about this with Berger, right? Thesis, antithesis, synthesis, it's a philosophical tool, something, it's opposite, and a new realization from those two opposites. Um, those are the main ideas. And that the Communist Manifesto is probably the piece of writing where Marx mentions the word communism the most. Now, a lot of other ideas that people say are Marxist, um, it's so different from Orthodox Marxism. It's almost a completely different thing. You know, it's like, I'm telling you, throwing around the word Marxist is like throwing around the word Christian. If you are Christian, do you want someone to to think that you're that you're all, always Catholic, or uh, someone that's like uh, a, on the Quaker Oats box, are you or are you an Amish person? Are all Christians Amish people? No, there's a spectrum, and when it's used like a boogeyman word, it's a clue that it's not correct. And in fact, there's a lot of socialist ideas. Just get this one thing straight: the Communist Manifesto is like instructions for. Workers to throw it over, uh, take over a capitalist society. So they unite. They have class consciousness. That means you're aware of classes in your in your society. And there's something called the dictatorship of the proletariat. The, the workers take over everything. Right? They round up rich people, take over their property, take over like the White House. Uh, you know, take over everything, control the government. This is like socialism. And then it that's like a dictatorship of the proletariat, then socialism, then communism. And, you know, there's a lot of critiques. There's the whole school of critical theory, which we might get into, which is why Marxism failed um, to a certain extent. It works in China. <laughs> and in reality, it's like different forms of Marxism, but it's still Marxism. Like I said, there's a spectrum. So... There's other thinkers that say the revolution doesn't come from the working class. There's other thinkers that say um, Marx was too simple about his idea of species being. There's other people that say violence isn't necessary. It's more of like a uh, reform type of revolution. There's other people that say 
uh, Marx didn't have a good idea of like other countries besides Europe, like America. There's all these aspects of sex and race that were ignored. So Marxism's kind of like changed over time. It's not so simple. So, and other arguments that I want you to know, um, like in our country, we have social security. That's like socialism. Um, but there's also government subsidies of capitalist ventures, not or just capitalist organizations like the bailout. If we were to have truly like Adam Smith classical economics, we wouldn't give our bankers bonuses for messing up our economy. Okay, that's socialism. So I think uh, Martin Luther King Jr. said in America, we have uh, socialism for the rich and rugged individualism for the poor. So America is more socialist than you think. And the people who say like socialism and Marxism are bad are taking advantage of socialist aspects of our country. Think of all the people that got the, uh, what are they? The PPP loans. I forget the acronym, but like when COVID and capitalism doesn't matter. Survival of the fittest free government uh, hands off you know uh private enterprise this is neoclassical economics uh they shouldn't stay open right so these are weird contradictions okay so i want you to think there's a lot there's almost like no place you can learn about marxism and a lot of times the information is bias so you know the reading i'll post it's going to talk about alienation, but it's just a really, his ideas are complex. Like Das Kapital, that book is like, those three volumes are huge. It's, it's complex, but, you know, it's criticism of capitalism is valid. Does that mean everything Marx says is right? No. But if we're a free country and you believe in free speech, why can't you learn about Marxism? And if you can't, how free is our country? Okay, food for thought. All right, going to turn this off now. I'm gonna post the reading, pay attention to that. And again, focus on alienation, basic historical materialism, history moves in stages, and uh, the dialectic. We talked about this before and those are the three like kind of big ideas I want you to take home and maybe some misconceptions that I talked about. All right. Hopefully this was entertaining a little bit. We'll see you guys next time.